My name is Gia Voltz, and I'm an investigator of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and a professor at the University of Colorado. In part two of my lecture series, I'm going to tell you about a bioID strategy that we use to identify factors and functions at membrane contact sites. So in part one of my lectures, I told you about membrane contact sites and their emerging roles in regulating the or organelle biogenesis, trafficking, and function. And you can go back and look at that video. But in this part, what I'm going to tell you about is how we used a BioID strategy to identify some of these membrane contact site proteins and study their function. So ER membrane contact sites are places where the elaborate ER network comes up close to other membranes. Organelles like the Golgi, endosomes, mitochondria, lipid droplets, peroxisomes, and also the plasma membrane. And we know a few things about these organelle contact sites. For one, these are places where the organelles are tethered, but they don't fuse. They're about 10 to 30 nanometers apart, so molecular distance. And the ER is smooth at these contact sites, so it's mainly tubular ER, and rough ER is excluded. So ribosomes are not there. We know several functions for ER membrane contact sites. One function is that at these contact sites, lipids actually flip from the ER membrane, where they are synthesized into the opposing membranes of other organelles. Another function for ER contact sites is calcium trafficking and regulation. So the ER stores a lot of calcium. Other organelles need calcium to activate various processes. At membrane contact sites, a large amount of calcium can be released at a contact site to trigger an event. And finally, we know that organelles undergo division at places where the ER wraps around them. And the specific organelles that do this that we know about are endosomes and mitochondria. Today, I'm going to focus on ER endosome contact sites and our attempts to identify machinery involved in regulating the functions of these contact sites. So this is a movie in an animal cell where we've labeled the ER in green and endosomes in red. The endosomes move around, and as they move around, they pull ER tubules around with them. I'll zoom in on an individual event. So here, quite beautifully, you can see that this endosome, as it moves up to the corner of this video, just pulls this ER network through that single contact site up along with it. And this begs the question of what are the functions of these contact sites. This is a cartoon of the endocytic pathway. So proteins at the plasma membrane receptors that need to be degraded are internalized out there at the plasma membrane into these clathrin-coated pits. They turn into early endosomes in that second panel. And early endosomes can then sort receptors that need to be recycled from those that need to be degraded. And they do this in these fission events where buds grow out with cargo, undergo fission, and sort it. Those early endosomes then mature into a late endosome, that third blue structure there. And then those late endosomes also can sort cargo that needs to be trafficked to the Golgi from cargo that needs to be degraded at the lysosome. We showed several years ago that the sites where these endosomes undergo sorting, budding, and fission reactions are defined by ER tubes actually wrapping around those sites and triggering fission events. I'm going to show you an example of what that looks like, because there are several features of this process that are really interesting and are really hard to understand without actually knowing how the machinery works and what that machinery is. So in this case, what we have is the ER is labeled in green in a live cell, endosomes are labeled in red, and the cargo is labeled in blue. I'll zoom in on an individual event here so that you can see what happens as it buds and then recruits the ER and then as it undergoes a fission reaction. So in this reaction here, up on top, there's an endosome labeled with red. It's just starting to form a little red bud. On the bottom, you can see the overlay with the green ER. And what you see is that, at first, there's just a single ER tube down there contacting that bud as it's just kind of growing out. And there's also an ER tube out where there's that arrow, and it's like an open C. What happens in the next frame is that C closes, makes a ring, and then the bud with cargo in it grows through that ring. And then between this frame and the next frame, that ring actually cinches up from here to there, and as it cinches up, it clips off that endosome bud. So there's so many interesting things about this process. It is hard to imagine how an ER tube actually gets recruited to that bud, knows that the bud is starting to form, then makes the C to form a ring around the bud. The bud grows through the ring, and then the ring actually doesn't trigger a fission of that bud 
until after cargo is sorted, because you don't want to clip off a bud if it has no cargo in it. So how is this whole process actually regulated? We know a few things about how cargo sorting and NSO budding occurs, and these things happen before the ER appears to be recruited. So actually on the back side of this endosome, up on top there, you already see some stable contact with the ER, but we think that this is mainly involved in calcium signaling and lipid trafficking. But at the bottom, what'll happen is that endosome bud starts to form th with the machinery that has been characterized over the years, where you actually have protein factors that pull out a bud, stabilize the bud, and then pull cargo into the bud. All of this appears to happen before the ER really puts its clamp on this endosome bud. Then the ER gets recruited, and then the bud actually gets clipped off. So what we wanted to do is to identify the machinery involved in this process. How do you identify a machinery that's so transient? A machinery where literally it's only forming a contact site as a bud starts to form and cargo starts to be sorted. That is a low abundance machinery. So we had a strategy to do this. One of our strategies was we knew that at that bud where cargo is sorted, there are certain protein factors that localize here, shown here in this white little uh, circle. There are proteins that are known to localize to the saddle of the bud where the ER tube will make contact for fission. And what we decided to do then was use a bioID strategy to identify proteins at this contact site. BioID is a promiscuous biotin ligase that was adapted so that it can be fused to another protein, expressed as a fusion protein that will now localize to a site of interest. It's a promiscuous biotin ligase, so it'll actually biotinylate anything within about 30 nanometers of itself. And contact sites are 10 to 30 nanometers, so this is a potentially good strategy for identifying proteins at these contact sites. So what we did, which is sort of cartooned in a way here, is that we fuse BioID, this promiscuous biotin ligase, to a factor that we know localizes us to the saddle of the endosome, express it into cells. As shown here, the endosome membrane is in red. We have a BioID fusion protein, FAM21 BioID, localizes to the saddle. And our hope was after we transfect this into cells, we can add biotin to those cells, and it should biotinylate the ER proteins at those contact sites. This is a validation to show you that this strategy can potentially work. In the left panel here, marked by the yellow arrow, I've shown you that this fusion protein localizes nicely to the saddle of the budding domain on this late endosome. In the middle panel, what we did was we now labeled uh, fixed cells for what's biotinylated. And you can see it lights up in the same spot at the base, the saddle of this endosome bud. And then you can also see that this biotinylation happens at a place where the endosome bud saddle interacts with the white ER network. So in theory, this could be a good strategy to identify factors involved. So this is how we did this experiment. And many people ask me about how to use BioID as a strategy to identify rare complexes. And a, a big uh, component of this is one, only put in very little, because you only want to express pretty much endogenous levels of these proteins, otherwise they get mislocalized. Two, it helps if you localize that protein to a very small region in the cell, and it's not just biotinylating everything in the cytosol. Three, you should have good controls. And the controls that we use in these experiments were, one, we put BioID as a fusion protein just to an endosomal membrane-bound protein. And so we fused BioID here. Right there, you can see we fused it to RAB7, which labels the membrane of an endosome. This should pick up any contact site proteins. And then we just had a control where we added biotin and just asked what in the background is biotinylated. The fourth key component to getting this uh, strategy to work is to get rid of everything that you don't want. And so what we decided to do was transfect these contracts into cells, and then we enriched only for ER proteins that are biotinylated. So the first thing we did was we got rid of the postnuclear supernatant. Then we got rid of mitochondria because they're full of biotinylated proteins. We got rid of, spun out the cytosol. 
And then we just purified this 20K light membrane fraction right there and asked, was it enriched? It was enriched for ER proteins, and it was enriched for biotinylated proteins. It was enriched for some endosomal proteins, and it was pretty much depleted of cytosol and most of the mitochondria. That's the fraction we took. We ran it over a streptavidin agarose column, which purifies biotinylated proteins, and then eluded it off that column and set up a collaboration with my colleague and identified by mass spec what proteins in the cell are biotinylated, what proteins specifically are in this ER membrane fraction. So the biggest hits you see here on the top that are enriched with FAM21, which was our, our fusion protein that localizes to the saddle of the bud, are known published components of uh, FAM interacting factors at the bud. So that was a good validation that this strategy worked. And those are shown up here. The second protein that we got, um, which came up in reasonable abundance, was a known uh, membrane contact site factor called VAP, which is an ER protein, but it's found at nearly every membrane contact site in the cell. So it's good that we found it at ER endosome contact sites, but it was probably not what we're looking for. It's involved in lipid trafficking. We literally got a single ER membrane protein that was enriched uh, with the BioID fusion protein to FAM21, that protein that sits at the base of the bud. And so because we only got a single protein, that's the one that we followed up on. This protein is TMCC1, transmembrane and coiled coiled domain containing protein. And there are three paralogs in animal cells, TMCC1 through 3. They're all ER membrane proteins. They all have two transmembrane domains at their C-terminus that anchor them to the ER membrane. And then in their N-terminus cytosolic domain, they have multiple coiled coiled domains. The first thing we did was we looked at the localization of this protein. We're looking for a protein that regulates recruitment of dynamic ER tubes to endosomes at contact sites. And so the first thing we saw was that, indeed, this is an ER membrane protein. In this case, it's overlaid with a general ER protein in red. The TMCC1 protein here is in green. And where they overlap, it's yellow. So one of the first things you notice is that the nuclear envelope, which labels nicely for ER membrane proteins that are general ER membrane proteins, does not contain TMCC1. TMCC1 is enriched in the ER tubes, Again, an area of the ER that's considered smooth ER, which we like because it should be involved in forming membrane contact sites. Another thing we see down here in this panel is that rather than being homogeneously distributed along the ER tubules, TMCC1 accumulates in little patches. And what's pretty cool is that when we actually look at live movies of these patches, they move all over the place. So they're moving around in the cell in a dynamic way along ER tubes. And that's kind of a nice, compelling localization, because what we're looking for is a dynamic tubular domain that's going to get recruited to form a membrane contact site. So to validate, is this protein involved in regulating ER membrane contact sites and endosome fission? One of the first things we asked was, do these dynamic domains actually accumulate at ER membrane contact sites with the endosome bud at the timing and position of endosome bud fission? So this would be a cartoon of what we hope to accomplish. The ER here, as a general ER protein, is in red. The endosome budding is in blue. Do these little green dynamic domains accumulate that's a saddle when the endosome bud is undergoing fission? And this is what the actual images look like. So now we have a general ER protein here on the tubular network in red. The endosome, we take a snapshot right, the final snapshot before it undergoes fission. You see it has a bud. At two seconds, fission has occurred, and we look at where does TMCC1 in green, where it overlays its yellow, localize at the position and timing. And you can see that it accumulates as this little yellow patch sitting over that saddle down at the bottom white arrow right before fission occurs. And we can score this and see that it's enriched at that site. The next thing we look at is if we deplete this protein, what is the effect on endosome morphology in general? We depleted the protein, and what we looked at is, do endosome buds still form? And also, do endosomes still have a normal morphology? So endosomes still are normal in appearance. 
without this protein. And they still, on the right here with that graph, we show that they still have buds. They have the same length. And they still accumulate cargo and all the markers of endosome buds. The big question, though, is do they still undergo fission? And the way we score fission is we make movies of fission events and ask, do we affect the efficiency of fission with and without this protein present? So here's an endosome bud. It grows out. And then in this next snapshot, it cleaves off and traffics off. So what's the efficiency without this TMCC1 protein? And what we find is that without the protein, we dramatically reduce by threefold the efficiency of endosome bud fission. And we specifically reduce the efficiency at sites that are labeled by the complex we use to identify the machinery that are specifically sorting cargo from the endosome bud to the Golgi. If this protein is involved in sorting cargo from late endosome buds, to the Golgi, then we should see that cargo no longer makes it to the Golgi. And the next thing we test to validate whether this protein was involved is whether cargo sorting is affected. And to do this, what we do is we pulse label out here at the plasma membrane, in that blue membrane there, a receptor that binds mannose 6-phosphate receptor. We pulse label an antibody to be internalized with those endosomes. If they traffic in, they should label the endosomes, and then they should also make it to the Golgi. If endosome bud fission is blocked here, we should see that those buds no longer carry cargo to the Golgi, and all the marker should stay in the vesicular population. And so on the top here, you can see most of the signal of this mannose 6-phosphate receptor makes it to the Golgi next to the nuclear envelope. And at the bottom, very little of it makes it to the Golgi. Most of it belongs, remains in the endocytic population. And so we can see that through this process, we're actually also uh, inhibiting trafficking to the Golgi. So, so far what I've told you is that we've used a bio-ID strategy to identify a machinery at a contact site. We find that it localizes in dynamic domains that accumulate only at, actually at the timing and position of endosome fission. I showed you that when we deplete it, we dramatically block fission, and that we also uh, inhibit cargo sorting to the Golgi. So a big question in this process is, you have a protein, it recruits the dynamic ER tube to the endosome bud, but something has to make sure that you don't recruit this dynamic ER tube to the endosome bud until after cargo has been sorted. So what on the endosome bud makes sure that the ER knows that it shouldn't come and cleave the endosome bud until after cargo? Is, has accumulated in the bud so that this process is productive. And we got a big clue about this from this Bioplex 2.0 screen that was published by Steve Giggy and Wade Harper's lab, because what they saw in this interactome was that the biggest interactors, some of the biggest interactors for the two paralogs of TMCC1, TMCC2, and TMCC3, was a protein called coronin. And coronin was a very interesting protein to us because coronin is known to localize to the saddle of the bud during cargo sorting. So the next thing that we asked was, is this protein coronin involved in recruiting ER tubes to form contact sites for endosome bud fission? And what we did was we depleted coronin from cells and we visualized ER contact sites with endosomes as they undergo budding reactions and asked what happens to those contact sites. So on the left here, you can see a control and you can see two types of interactions. At, at the back side of this sort of round endocytic compartment, you can still see that the ER there wraps around the back side of this endosome. So there's still contacts at those sites that presumably regulate calcium trafficking and lipid trafficking. And also, you see where the ER crosses over the saddle at that white arrow of that bud in the control cells. On the right, though, when we deplete coronin, what you can see is that there's still contact at the backside of this endosome where there's that yellow arrow. But the ER no longer crosses very well over the base of the bud labeled by that marker. And so you get this phenotype, which we like to call sort of buds in space, where the bud sits out there in space, but it's not attacked by the ER tube. 
And doing experiments like this, we showed that coronin is important for recruiting those dynamic ER tubes to form contact sites for fission. So the next question is, does this protein TMCC1 play a role in recruiting the ER specifically to those coronin patches? And does it give a similar phenotype for ER recruitment as coronin? And so what we did was we depleted here TMCC1 and asked what happens to ER contact with the bud. And we see almost the identical phenotype that we saw when we deplete coronin. On the left is the control, and you can see that the ER in red contacts the backside of the endosome and crosses over the base of the bud labeled in white there. But on the right, when we deplete TMCC1, at the yellow arrow, you just have, again, these sort of buds floating around in space, and ER is no longer recruited to that patch that's now labeled there in white with coronin. So a similar phenotype. We can also deplete coronin and see that similar to TMCC1, it results in a threefold reduction in endosome bud fission, so they almost phenocopy each other. So together, what I've told you about is a strategy that we use to identify a very low abundant contact site uh, complex and how we've been able to use BioID uh, to do this. And what this has done is led to a model for how endosome bud formation, cargo sorting, and fission is regulated uh, spatially and temporally over time. So what we know about from the literature is that there are various components, like sorting nexons and retromers, that help play a role in pulling out the endosome bud. There's an actin nucleating complex called WASH, which is actually part of the complex we used as a bio fusion to identify TMCC1. Its role is to localize to the base of the bud, and it nucleates actin, branched actin. That stabilizes the bud so that cargo has time to sort into the bud. And then coronin comes on, and what's so interesting about coronin is that coronin, historically, is thought to be an act, branched actin depolymerizer. So it binds branched actin after branched actin is there and disassembles it. And it also plays a role in recruiting dynamic ER tubes. So from the point of view of how you regulate this thing over time, it's nice because coronin should come on after you've already sorted cargo with actin into the bud, and then you recruit ER to drive ER-associated endosome bud fission. So at this point, our goal is to see how much of this machinery is conserved to other organelles. We know the ER drives mitochondrial division as well. And so what are the common machineries and mechanisms that the ER uses to divide other organelles? And with that, I want to thank the people who contributed to this work, and thank you for listening to my lecture.